Hey friends, software is everywhere, putting us devs on the front lines of innovation, improving people's lives, shipping new and better features, all while moving faster than ever before, which is where our friends at Raygun can help. Their powerful error and performance monitoring tools make it easy to get all the diagnostics you care about for your team's web and mobile apps. When there's an issue, it shows you exactly what's going on, who is being impacted, and how to fix the root cause, down to the specific line of code. See how your users are experiencing your website or app in real time and ship better code faster with confidence, knowing that Raygun will alert you to any new issues or regressions. Start a free 14-day trial of Raygun today and try it for yourself. It only takes a few lines of code and their simple usage-based plans start at $4 a month, a small price to pay to get your team and users to love you. Visit raygun.com. Try it out. Thank me later. Hi, I'm Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes in association with the ACM Bytecast. Today, I'm chatting with Yao Anakwa, the founder and CEO of ODK. How are you, sir? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me, Scott. So ODK stands for what? Uh, originally, it standard for Open Data Kit in the sense that it's an open source data collection toolkit. These days, we just call it ODK in the same way that people don't call IBM International Business Machines anymore, right? It's just become an acronym that means data collection. Okay. And on its face, it is it is powerful offline forms. And it's interesting because people pick their taglines and it matters. Those taglines matter. Every word matters. You didn't say powerful forms to collect data. You didn't say data collection toolkit. You said powerful offline forms. Why is that important? Well, because ODK's value add, its, it's primary differentiator is the fact that the forms themselves work entirely offline. And they're not sort of simple forms like you see in SurveyMonkey or Google Forms. They're really forms that end up looking like mini applications. So the forms can collect, obviously, text and numbers, but they can collect GPS coordinates. They can collect pictures. They can scan barcodes. Uh, they can have complex logic associated with them. So they really are powerful forms, and they work entirely offline. Were they always powerful forms? Because I understand that you started this as a software engineering intern at Google. Did you start with like text boxes over data? And then when did you get into complicated data formats? We, we started complicated. So the, the story there was that I was a, a grad student at the University of Washington in Seattle. And my advisor, Gaetano, had uh, an internship, a sabbatical rather, at Google. And so we went there to build a, a powerful offline form tool um, because it was just right around the time that Android was starting. And so as researchers, we thought, here's an awesome opportunity to build something on an entirely open source data collection uh, operating system, mobile operating system, and do something that you couldn't do on a basic J2ME phone or a Nokia phone at the time. So we went in wanting to build, you know, uh, powerful offline forms. Mm -hmm. And offline meaning it's going to put it on local storage of the, the device that you're on. Uh, and then when it when it docks or when it gets connection or when does it sync up and is it a bidirectional sync or a, a one way sync? Yeah, it's a it's a bidirectional sync. And so uh, the typical use case is that you have a, a data collector or in our industry we call it an enumerator, somebody who's out in the field, usually you know remote place uh, with no internet connection, and they're maybe doing a household survey. They're going house to house and they're filling out forms. And uh, if and when that mobile device sees either a cell connection or a Wi-Fi connection, it sends all the forms that have been finished up to the server. And if there are any updates or new forms, those get downloaded automatically in the background. Um, mm. And, you know, we have users who are maybe in the Amazon rainforest doing community-based forest monitoring. They're out there for months at a time collecting data. And whenever there's a connection, the data goes up uh, and new forms come down. Mm -hmm. And I'm imagining, uh, simplistically, people walking from, you know, door to door doing censuses, but that's humans talking to humans and helping them fill out forms. But you, as you said, you're doing surveys. I'm assuming that you're not just talking to humans, you're talking to devices. It's primarily uh, humans in the sense that uh, the typical use case is a, a household survey, um, mm -hmm. but it varies. Uh, so, for example, uh, the surveys don't have to be about people. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have uh, examples of of users who are documenting uh, the health of, of forests or farms or, or, or users who are monitoring um, uh, animals. Um, the common case, though, is there's a, a person who is interrogating, you know, asking questions about a thing uh, and collecting data about that and then sending that to a place where the data can be acted on. 
And is the, the help me understand the software architecture here. There's a collector and there's a server, but are you a, a giant world database? Are you like a Power BI? Uh, no, not so much. So we provide software that people can install either locally on their own machine, self-hosted, um, or we provide a managed cloud hosted service. And each customer or each user, they set up their own machines uh, or have their own account to collect the data just for them. So the data doesn't flow into one big database. It flows into their database. It's their data, and they can do with that data um, whatever they want to do with. That seems, that's pretty cool. I mean, the idea that this is for the people, by the people, there's nothing underneath it. There's nothing hidden or sneaky in it. It's power to the people in the literal sense embodied by software. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, there are some platforms where, you know, essentially it's free, you're collecting the data, but behind the scenes, the data is being used and sold and, and marketed. Uh, in this case, ODK is an open source project. It's targeted exclusively towards social impact organizations, folks who work in public health, folks who work in in, in climate monitoring, in election monitoring, uh, and it's their data and they use that data for critical decision making. Uh, and because a lot of the data is sensitive, sometimes it's government data, sometimes it's, it's personal data, uh, we want to make sure that it's, it clearly belongs to the people who are collecting it. Uh, and there's no nothing nothing sneaky or, or hidden about it. Mm -hmm. In the... Um in the early 2000s, uh, you know, you had your own consulting company. You did some work at Intel, working on some custom hardware. Uh, then it looks like you started doing some volunteer work as a software engineer. Help me understand where you went kind of the from the classical working for a big company, doing stuff to public goods. Yeah, um, I, I suppose it happened. I was a grad student at the University of Washington, and I, I saw a talk by Neil Lesh. I remember this to this very day, and he was talking about how he was sort of uh, a wandering do-gooder. He was nomadic. He was wandering around East Africa. And um, he he gave a talk about how he was fixing um, uh, computers uh, in, in hospitals. And I thought that was so compelling that I, I talked to my advisor and I said, you know, I, at this time, I, I think I was building NFC soft, uh, hardware for Intel as an intern. And I thought, like, I just don't think that that's the best use of my time. So I volunteered. I actually went to Partners in Health in in Rwanda, they were setting up a medical record system there, uh, and I volunteered there for six months. And I, it was mind blowing. I really saw that with a little bit of technology, you could, you could change the lives of so many people. And so, what I did there was, you know, I set up a medical record system, and I saw that that system, electronic medical records, could increase the quality and, and the scale of HIV and TB care. And, and so, having seen that, I thought, as a computer scientist, well, can we? Can we make this more abstract? Can we make this more usable for folks who, who don't have to set up a medical record system? Uh, and so the general problem of taking a paper form, which is ubiquitous in, in social impact, digitizing it and, and giving that data back to the people who are collecting it. Um, yeah, that's what started me on that journey. And, and so, yeah, I gave up on the ubiquitous computing and the NFC stuff. And I thought, well, here is something that is, you know, in many ways so simple, but can make a huge difference to folks um, uh, all over the world. Now, I recognize that you're not done yet, but I'll use the word <laughs> dedicate your life. Did you know that this was going to be it? Did you find your thing at this point? Uh, at the time, I have to admit, you know, I was, I remember when Gaetano, my advisor at that time, uh, called me and I was working on some SMS based project in Tanzania. I was sitting on some beautiful beach, having a beer and Gaetano called me, uh, on my cell and said, Hey, I'm going to Google to work on this data collection project. And I thought, I'm okay. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable here. I'm exploring new research ideas. I don't, I don't want to go back to the States to um, go work, uh, you know, in, in Seattle in some office. Uh, and so I told Gaetano no. And, but Gaetano was very persistent. He called me and my buddy, uh, uh, Carl Hartung, who was also a grad student, called me and said, come on, you got to come back and stop messing about. So I, I returned to Seattle, to Fremont, and I started working on it. I didn't think it was going to work. I'll be the first to admit it. I thought, I mean, giving at that time $600 smartphones to rural farmers in Uganda just didn't seem super compelling. But I got into it. Uh, we deployed uh, the first versions of the software, and um, it was just amazing to see how people took to it and, and how valuable they found it. Um, and that was about 15 years ago, actually. And you're asking, is it my life's work? I must say it's become my life's work um, because I've seen the impact it has on people. And if you uh, if you let me sort of expand on that, you know, you are a software developer. A lot of people on this call, on, on this uh, talk might be software developers as well and listening to this podcast. 
it's extremely hard to build software, as you know. Um, it, it's hard to build software. It's hard to build software that is uh, useful in any way. It's hard to build software that works. It's hard to build software that has an impact. And it's hard to do all of that and make it open source and have this sort of positive impact. And so um, over time, I've come to realize that uh, what we've done is really incredible. It's rare. And as one of the founders of the project, it's sort of become my responsibility to protect this sort of unique thing that exists. Um, and so, you know, I don't, it, it's a responsibility that I take seriously. Um, the software is having such impact on the, on the world that, uh, we have to keep it going. And, uh, at the end of the day, I enjoy it. You know, it's just a fun project to work on, uh, to hear from users about the impact that they're having. And, um, yeah, we just have to keep it going. So yeah, these days it's my life work. I get up every morning, uh, thinking about data collection. I, I go to sleep thinking about data collection and, uh, it's on a bad life. It's definitely not a bad life. You know, uh, you know I, I currently work at, at, at Microsoft, so we're making a lot of big software, but it's a bajillion people. And one of the things that I've found is that the engineers and the program managers that don't talk to customers, that don't spend time with them, are they have a, a, an ennui, a malaise of just like, you know, time to make the donuts. And they just kind of, but if you sit with someone whose life you changed, it fundamentally changed. It sounds like you got that experience early. Like you talked to customers and you can't stop talking to customers. Yeah, I always do it even to this day. Um, so I, um, I do a lot of the customer demos for people who are signing up for our cloud hosted service. And so, yeah, every, pretty much every morning, starting from five to 6 uh, AM, I am in calls with customers showing them the software so I do that a lot. Um, ODK from the beginning, because it's an open source project, has always had a, a dynamic and active community. And so we have about, I think at this point, maybe about 14 or 15,000 people on our community forum. Um, that started as a mailing list. And um, so I talk to those folks all the time. We also have a technical advisory board with people from the community that I talk to you know, every, um, every month or so. So I love talking to customers. It's how we know that we are on the right path and doing and doing the correct kind of work. So there's yeah. no no on we there. Yeah, and you've but you're you're addicted to it in the best way. Like you have to talk to the customer, otherwise. Oh yeah, what are we I mean, I, otherwise, how do I know what we are supposed to build next? I mean, we, <laughs> um, and we have to do it also because the context in which we work in is, is like pretty unique. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you're you know, at a Microsoft or Google and you're building software for businesses or, or folks in the West, then it's very easy because you're functionally building software for people like you. But we are not building software for people like us. We're building software that works in very specific environments uh, under certain constraints. And so the only way that we can build that software and make it relevant is by having uh, an open, open lines of communication to the folks who are using it. Um, and yeah. so that is, is key to our success. Yeah, and that customer empathy seems to come out in your forums. I've looked at a number of different ODK forums, and for some of them, particularly ones that are in developing countries, I noticed that, um, I don't know how to say this, the buttons were kind of big. It felt kind of chunky. And I was trying to understand why are these buttons so big? And then I started to apply some empathy to it, and I think I know why. And I'm, wouldn't you mind telling me? Yeah, so uh, there's lots of sort of UI affordances, uh, user interface affordances in, in ODK. And those are things that have been learned over the years. And so the first time we deployed ODK was in Uganda in 2008. We were working with some rural farmers. They were in, um, they were in huts uh, without a lot of electricity. And a lot of them had um, callous fingers because, you know, look at your fingers, Scott. You're a programmer. Your fingers are soft and squishy, no calluses. <laughs> um, if you look at a farmer's fingers, they are calloused. And so the way a touchscreen works is through this capacitive touch where electricity is sort of passing through your fingers a small mm -hmm. charge. Uh, and if you have calluses, that small charge doesn't work so well. And so what we do with ODK is that the buttons are big because our, our, our customers, our users, uh, they need a big touch surface. Our buttons are big because most of them don't have glasses or corrected vision. Uh, and so there are all these sorts of affordances that, you know, ODK may look chunky to you um, because you're living a very comfortable life. But I assure mm -hmm. you the millions of users that we have use ODK uh, because of that chunkiness, uh, it's yeah. because these chunky, these these big chunks are affordances that enable them to collect the data that they need. 
And I love that, that I appreciate that. And again, no disrespect intended by the word chunky, just trying to express the sense of a, you know, it's a, it's a swollen UI. And it made me think about my, my father who worked with his hands his entire life. And I watch him struggle with his iPhones because he's got big hands that look like banana bunches that are covered in calluses and he jabs at the screen. But as soon as I just pumped up all the fonts on his phone, everything got better. All the hit points are better. Exactly. And Here's the thing, though. My lack of empathy initially was like, well, I don't understand why you're having a problem with this. What's the deal? It's not that hard. It works for button. me and my, my, dainty, <laughs> my dainty fingers work fine. What is the problem with you? Um, and, and that you're building that empathy all the way through because you've got the collect, the collect application and then you've got ODK Central, right? Now, is That's ODK correct. Central a database or is it a server that catches data? And where does the data end up? Yeah, so uh, Collect is the mobile app. So it's, it's in the Play Store uh, the Android Play Store and uh, Central is the server, and so the server, you know, runs on somebody's infrastructure, either on our managed hosted solution or uh, on premise or locally on somebody's server, and it hosts the blank forms, and it also hosts the data that is being sent. So the idea is that uh, uh, maybe a project manager puts the forms that they want the data collector to fill out on the central server. The phone links up to the server, downloads it, and then the submissions go back to the server. And once it's on the server. We make it really easy for folks to sort of use that data, be it downloading it as a CSV or Excel file where they can do their reports. Um, and naturally, we're programmers, so it has a, a beautiful REST API so people can integrate it with other systems, including tools like Power BI and 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 R and and um, and, and Python to sort of pull that data into their data analysis work streams. And you you say that you can do that on prem, so you could have that private and self hosted with a little support. But you also, of course, offer your own reliable cloud version of this as well. That's exactly right. Yep. This is a public good, but if people who are listening right now, if they have a text boxes over data problem, you've solved that. I think so, and a lot of our users think so. So yeah, it's a it's a nice solution um, for folks. And you know, it, it didn't we didn't always used to have the cloud hosted option. Um, you know, and I want to talk a little bit about that because. You know, as as computer science researchers or as uh, you know, open source enthusiasts, we always thought like, oh, I mean, obviously people want to run their own servers, so we don't want to be in the business of running servers. We will just give people the software and freedom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it took us a long time to sort of reach the point where a lot of our users don't want to run their own servers. It is a lot of work, um, and so we came to a point about two years ago where we wanted to solve two problems. The first problem was that. It's really hard to build an open source project and make it financially sustainable when you're giving away the software and applying for grants that come you know, randomly. And so it was hard to sort of thoughtfully evolve the software. So that was the first problem. And then the second problem is what I just mentioned is that uh, people don't want to run servers. Running servers is hard. Email delivery is hard. There are all these sort of hard problems that you don't want to be taking on as a nonprofit or a government. So um, we launched our cloud-hosted solution for that reason, is that it makes people very easy to get a, an account and just collect the data you need. And it gives us this sort of predictable revenue that we can use to hire people and sort of thoughtfully evolve the software as opposed to randomly, you know, evolve the software based on what grant we get at what particular time. Right. And that now is self-sustaining. And you're, like you said, you're talking to customers every day and they're signing up every day. Yeah, it's been really, um, it's been really amazing to see. Um, I, I suppose it took us, you know, 14, 15 years to get there. Uh, but yeah, we're much, you know, uh, it, it's a very popular service, cloud service, and uh, it's enabling us to sort of ship more software quickly. When did you know, though, that it worked? You just said that 14, 15 years. So I'm getting this sense that you were, you're an overnight success in just 15 years. So and anyone can do it. Just grind alone in a room for 15 years. I think that's the key to it. You know, <laughs> um, we always talk about like, you know, there's lots of things that we could be doing better, but there's something to be said. Um, about showing up every day and just trying to get better every day. And so um, when we started in 2008, I knew it was working um, because I got an, I got an email uh, maybe a few months in after we deployed the software um, from a group in Kenya. And they said, uh, we have deployed ODK on 3,000 phones in rural Kenya. Um, and the project is over. We've collected so much data. They were distributing water filtration devices. And so I'm, I'm addicted to email, you know, instead of doing my graduate research, I'm just responding to support posts um, because that's more fun. And I responded immediately. I was like, did you mean, you know, 30 or, or 300? And they're like, no, 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 3000. And that's when I was really blown away because at that time I, I didn't know, you know, we had that many users. And to me, it was mind blowing that somebody would take just, you know, random software from the internet, put it on a bunch of devices 
deploy it to the middle of nowhere on 3,000 phones and have success with it. Uh, and so I knew that we were on the right track then because it had sort of, somebody had found it, found it useful, had success with it, and we were not involved at all. Um, that's when I knew. But yeah, that was like in 2009 or something like that. And then we've been grinding ever since. From a technical perspective, were you in any way surprised that that uh, production load test worked? You could They could have said we put it on 3,000, but it only worked on two. I was very surprised because um, I have to be honest about that. You know, as grad students uh, at the time, your job isn't to write production quality code. Your, your job is to write the minimum amount of code needed to test an idea, evaluate it, and write your paper. And so anything that looks like production code means that you've spent too much time on the engineering side and not enough time on the research side. So um, obviously, you know, we try to make it as robust as possible, but um, yeah, I was surprised. We've, we've made a lot more progress since then, but uh, yeah, we've been very fortunate. Do you spend too much effort on handling content in your project? Stop solving boring tasks and get back to code. Let's thank our sponsor, Content.ai. They are the modular content platform that enables marketers and developers to plan, create, and deliver experiences that look and feel great on any channel, not just websites. But if a website is your main channel, you can leverage the CDN-backed content delivery with .NET Core SDKs, .NET Model Generator, and a fluent API, which makes it easier to filter and order content. What makes Content.ai truly unique is the ease of doing business with them. Hubs in New York, London, Amsterdam, Brno, and Sydney, Content.ai's globally distributed team ensures the success of leading companies like Zurich Insurance, Angolia, and Oxford University. See more at Content.ai, that's content with a K, dot AI slash developers. That's K-O-N-T-E-N-T dot AI slash developers. Or visit them live at the Live 360 conference in Orlando or Dev Intersections in Las Vegas. The first Android phone came out just 14 years ago. Like Android has taken over the planet and particularly yeah. the African continent. Yeah. Um, you can't go anywhere without bumping into an Android phone on the continent. But that means that in summer of 2008, there wasn't an Android phone on That's the African correct. continent. correct. Yeah. Or, or we, was there? There wasn't. And in fact, um, I'm, I'm sure the, the statute of limitations have passed um, by now. But um, we, uh, myself and Carl Hartung, who's my co-founder on, on ODK, um, we were again, interns at Google and we, we brought the first, I'm pretty sure we brought the first Android phones to the African continent. Now we didn't tell anybody we were importing these new devices, but we loaded up 20 phones into our, our bags, uh, uh, flew to Uganda for a project and, and brought, uh, the Motorola. I think they were G1s, HTC G1s. Yeah. HTC G1 was October, 2008. Yeah. We brought those phones, 20 of those phones to the continent. Now, you know, Android is everywhere um, throughout the world. ODK runs on, let's see, last I checked, maybe like 22,000 different Android devices. It runs on TVs. We actually have maybe about five or six users who use ODK on TVs, which it doesn't really make sense. Like, how could you, how does that even work? But the analytics show that people are using it on TV. So yeah, it's it's crazy. Do, do you ever dig into that? Like, I'm imagining someone coming into like a health clinic and they're sitting in the, in the, in the room with a smart TV on the remote, filling out a form, <laughs> waiting to get seen. Like you don't, do you know what they're using my, it for? We haven't, you know, we an anonymize all this stuff. So we, we, we know that people are using it on TVs, but we don't know who and why. <laughs> um, my guess is that it's really nice on a big TV when you're doing a training. So, you know, you have a, a team of, you know, 500 people who are going out to collect data and you have an Android mm. TV. Well, you might as well install ODK there and then people can see the interface. Um, and so they must be using it for training. But I, I can't imagine somebody in the rainforest carrying around like a 27 inch TV on their back and using that for data collection. <laughs> now, this is an open source. It has a wonderful API. You pointed out that it has a, a rich web API. Does yep. it have plugins and the ability to talk to other systems or does it talk to other systems via its open data formats? Yeah, that's a it's a great question. So um, ODK is it is open source and has lots of APIs. I would say the way that most people, most sort of developers interact with ODK is, is two ways. The first is by um, forking it in some way. So um, ODK was is kind of the the first uh, and most well known sort of data collection platform in the, in the global health and development space. And so a lot of there are a lot of derivatives of ODK that are out there. Um, and so chances are, if you see somebody collecting data in the field somewhere, uh, either they're using ODK or they're using an old clone of ODK or they're using ODK's format in some way. So that's sort of very, um, very typical. 
The other way that people interact with it is with our um, API. So we have specs and APIs that a lot of platforms, you know, uh, implement. Uh, and that's been kind of nice because we have this sort of standard representation for a form that people can implement their own ODK compatible services. And there, there are a bunch of those. And you do have a relationship. I understand that XLS form is a standard for building forms in Excel. And is it true that ODK like, can speak Excel forms? It's it's more than that. So uh, XLS form is a format that was uh, uh, developed and pioneered by a company called Ona, great group of folks over there. Um, and now the ODK team maintains it. So we maintain and evolve the XLS form standard. We maintain and evolve a, a platform called Enketo, which is a web uh, renderer for that form standard and a lot of the core libraries uh, under the hood. Um, and wow. So, and so, these are standards, like published standards that we can go and learn about and use. Yeah, they are published standards. You know, they're not like WC3 standards mm. in that way, but they're mm-hmm. sort of the de facto standard for, for data collection, particularly offline. So yeah, both the forms, the, the underlying libraries, uh, the APIs, we maintain all of those. I'm just kind of thinking about the time frame here. I don't think the, I think the cloud just started when you started and Android phones just started when you started. You really had a good impeccable. idea at the right time. I mean, how, how good is that? Yeah, we feel very lucky. You know, um, we were at the right place at the right time with the right team. Um, and it, it just sort of worked out um, really nicely. We're very fortunate. I do, I do have a, a weird relationship with the word luck. So I want to gently push back. And I think you'll probably <laughs> agree with me that, that luck is opportunity plus being prepared. And you were absolutely prepared and an opportunity presented itself. So you didn't get lucky. You made lucky. Yeah, and and I um, I understand that point uh, for sure. As uh, I think my wife says it, you know, you you get dealt a set of cards and you play them well. Um, but I also never want to discount um, uh, sometimes the randomness of it. Um, so maybe I was lucky in two thousand eight, and then I've been I've been working at it for a long time since. Yeah. That is the thing. It's hard work. There is there's there's luck that you see in a in a in a press release or a single Instagram post, but then there's also the five years of grinding. For uh, sure. That that makes the big difference as well. Now I understand that ODK is being used in the public health sector, it's being used for large scale disease surveillance, it's being largely it's humanitarian, it's the public good. Yeah. Are are there commercial uses? Are people using it just in companies to do late stage capitalism? <laughs> or do you discourage that? <laughs> we don't discourage anybody. You know, we believe in sort of freedom in the sense that you can use it for whatever. I'm sure, you know, I know of militaries that use it. I know of banks that use it. I know of a um, a uh, seat manufacturer for an electronic car company whose name starts with a T um, that, <laughs> that uses it. Um, and so <laughs> what could it be? Um, so Can't win them all. Yeah, we, in, in many ways, we... You know, we don't we don't want to prevent anybody from collecting the data they need, um, but our focus always is on the social impact sector. So those are the folks who determine what features we build. Um, and if you know banks or uh, or other companies want to use it for capitalism, that's fine. It, you know, it's their it's their it's their prerogative. I hope this isn't too personal of a question, but like you could turn on the marketing machine and hire a bunch of salespeople and turn this into a money printing machine. But you at every turn have not done that. I don't even know if you have a marketing department. I am the marketing department. <laughs> <laughs> we don't You've have chosen market- though, not to turn this into a, a, a machine. I, I, like I guess I don't get, maybe I'm, I'm simple minded. I'm not a, you know, a, a business mind or whatnot. I, yeah, I just don't get the point of all of that. There are plenty of uh, data collection platforms that have great marketing. Um, you know, our job, the team's job, our focus is just to build the stuff that uh, folks find useful, relevant to their work, and allows them to do that work. Uh, we generate, you know, enough money to do that, and and no more. And we have a lot of fun doing it. And I think uh, our marketing machine really is our community, the people who use it in the field. And sometimes when I get on calls with customers. They say, well, I ask them always, like, how did you find out about ODK? And often the answer is, oh, we use this other platform and our data collectors refuse to use it um, because they don't want to, you know, they get paid per submission. And if the submissions get lost, they don't get paid. And so they really trust ODK um, and they refuse to use something else. And I think that trust comes from years of us doing the right thing uh, when the, the going got tough 
and um, not using it as a money printing machine. We really genuinely, everybody who works on the team, we believe in producing a public good, making it as widely available as possible and helping folks who are helping uh, others uh, do their work. And, and if I want to do something else, yeah, I could just get a job somewhere else. But yeah. uh, what's the point of that? There's plenty of people well, who are doing that. You know, yeah. so you have yeah. enough and you sleep better at night and you are affecting the lives of millions and millions of people, which is it's pretty exactly good. Upside. I just don't I don't understand why more people don't do it. <laughs> I have to be honest with you. <laughs> it just seems like it to me. It's such a it's a it's such a joy and a privilege. I don't know why people aren't um, stopping what they're doing now and, and doing some more stuff. But, you yeah, know, different strokes for different folks, I guess. I love that you say that your marketing team is your community. I know that you are a big fan of discourse, not yeah. discord with a hard D, but discourse, That's the correct. forum, and you run your yeah. forums on discourse as well. So when you're out there deploying open source software, you're also recommending other open source projects for, for, for deployment. Yeah, for sure. You know, I am not sort of uh, uh, religious um, about open source. Um, I, I think it, it prevents locking and these kinds of things. Um, but to me, the very idea that other folks are out there building software and essentially giving it away and giving folks the power to um, do what, what they want with the software is just a, a nice thing to do. So um, I love discourse as a, as a platform. Um, we use it uh, a lot in ODK. And whenever I get a chance to sort of advocate for it, I, I, I'm the first one to do that because it ultimately, it's been the heart of our project because it enables us to connect to our community and and get input from the community and and that's essential to building great software. Very cool. Well, uh, folks can check out ODK at getodk.org. That's correct. You can learn all about it. And I think that the the number one thing as a member of of your community, as the open source community, as the technical community, as a computer scientist myself, it's about awareness. So I'm happy to be a member of your community and your marketing department now. Perfect. And if folks are listening right now, Yes, if folks are listening and you have a problem and you think, wow, the ODK has solved that problem, then you can check it out at getodk.org. Thank you so much, Yao and Aqua, for chatting with me today. Uh, thanks for, for having me, Scott. And um, yeah, if there's any way I can help anybody listening to the podcast, uh, my email, I always like to share my email. My email is yanakwa, first name, first initial, last name at getodk.org. You can send me any question you'd like about open source, about data collection, and I, I commit to answering it. So send those emails in. Absolutely brilliant. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes in association with the ACM Bytecast. If you're listening to it at Hansel Minutes, there's other shows that you can listen to. And if you're listening to it at the ACM, be sure to explore the back catalog of the ACM Bytecast. And we'll see you again next week.